Hey, Seattle hockey fans, welcome to another episode of Locked on Kraken. I'm your host, Erica L. Ayala. We have a pretty good show. We're going to go back to our good reads. I've got two articles that I found really fascinating. One that's a more general look at defensemen, uh, getting us ready for that defense conversation coming tomorrow. And then another one that is about the Seattle Kraken and their conditioning in the training camp and preseason. That's what's coming up and more on this episode of Locked on Kraken. You are Locked on Kraken. Your daily podcast on the Seattle Kraken. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network. Your team every day. We are the Seattle Kraken. Hey, hey, what do you say, Seattle hockey fans? Welcome to another episode of Locked on Kraken. I am your host, Erica L. Ayala. I'm a freelance multimedia journalist and your podcast host here for Locked on Kraken. Been able to take this show to Beijing, to Boston, covering Maddie Beneers. We've, of course, been to the expansion draft and much more. That's what we've done and the best is yet to come as we head into season two. Talked about it yesterday on yesterday's show but the Seattle Kraken they were having some fun uh playing a little bit of golf and we got to see over on the Seattle Kraken social media account that they took us behind the scenes what did we see uh who would you not want on your team Philip Grubauer and Jared McCann were some big names coming up there. Very interesting to see that here. Uh, also, the Seattle Kraken let us know, since we have some off days, what kind of content do we want to see? More practice content or more golf content? It was about a 50-50 split, so I think we're going to get a little bit of everything. Here's that poll that we got from the Seattle Kraken. If you're watching on YouTube, what would be your vote? You want more on ice action or you want more golf action? I personally would like to see the action on the ice. The Seattle Kraken were able to hit practice and they had a nice crowd. Love that they made that practice available to fans in the local area. The Seattle Kraken, of course, on the road as they take on the Vancouver Canucks tomorrow. We'll have a game day episode and talk about a little defense. Um, getting ready for that. Um, but I want to uh, take us over to something that came out from the Seattle Times. This was a story about conditioning and what people call a particular drill in hockey. I first heard of it as called bag skating. Um, in other sports, I call it other things, one term that I don't use anymore. Um, but Kate Shefty with a really interesting article, conditioning skates, wind sprints, whammies, two and a half, bag skates, many names for the basic infamous drill where one goes up and down the ice at a high speed. And as I said to open the show, I want to talk about Goodreads. I want to get back to this. I find it really great, especially as someone who is a journalist, I do a lot of writing myself, to take you to some of the stories and how people are not only covering the Seattle Kraken, but the NHL uh, team here. And so conditioning is a big part of a preseason. It can be a really big part of any uh, season. I come from the women's hockey side. And so it was really interesting to see over the years, coaches start to implement conditioning into practice. Now on the women's side of things, they're lucky if they have the whole team for any one practice, but they only have two practices a week. They play on the weekends and most people uh, have other jobs. So conditioning during practice and really getting that heartbeat and that heart rate up is so important. Uh, and so in this article by Kate, we pay attention to every detail. Conditioning is a big part. There's also a mental piece to grinding through a conditioned drill. 
It's not a lot of fun, but everyone does it together. You work through it together and you build camaraderie through that. I love that quote. I love this article, just taking a look at what it takes to be a competitor. And that is something that the Seattle Kraken, I think, have to continue to develop. We saw them be a, a hardworking team. There's another article that we'll get to in a little bit where Ron Francis talks about he felt that his team really did work hard and, and they were a hard team to play against, but the systems and the skill set just wasn't there. The team hadn't come together. They didn't have the pieces that they wanted. So as you start building the pieces, the one thing that you can't shirk on are the fundamentals and conditioning is a part of that. It's been interesting to hear other people, Linda Cohn, who was on the show talking about how maybe Philip Grubauer wasn't his most fit. And that does make an impact. Um, and so you also heard, we've heard Maddie Beniers talk about putting on weight and thinking about what he's eating so that he can keep the weight that he gained and not just burn it off as he starts doing more conditioning drills. So I loved this. Um, also the term bag skate, particularly I knew it as something that was a punishment. You bag skate your team when they're just not focusing, when they're not doing what they need to do. It's like the miracle again, again scene, you know? And again, again, <laughs> coming from other sports, basketball in particular, where again, we had another name for those, a name that I don't use anymore, but, um, definitely was a punishment. In the preseason, it was something that we did. It essentially was part of practice. But doing that during a season and having your legs so fatigued, sometimes it's used as a punishment. And I think that's as, as much as part of the mental game, or at least it was when I was playing. So um, I thought that was a pretty cool um, little article there. As I mentioned, there's another article that I want to take you to. And this one comes from The Athletic. And I talked about who's going to make the squad yesterday on yesterday's show. And, of course, the big question is, is this guy right here, number 51, going to make the art of going to make the article. He did make the article. Is he going to make the roster? Uh, so this is Pierre Lebrun, Shane Wright, Matty Beneers, and the Kraken's formula to contend for the playoffs in year two. Now, some of what's in this article we've talked about, some of it is, um, where it is Ron Francis talking about how he didn't have an extra coach. Uh, Lebrun talks about how there was a lot of conversation about Dave Haxtell, but that Ron Francis is holding fast and staying true to Dave Haxtell. Um, and of course there's conversation about whether Shane Wright is going to make the roster. And that's where I want to take you again, check the show notes for Kate's article, or I didn't think, I don't think I said that check the show notes for Kate's article and check the show notes for this article over at the athletic. This one does have a paywall, but um, I want to take you to um, the, the question about, Shane Wright. And first, I loved this. Ron Francis on his message to Shane, my message has been simple. Play hockey and have some fun. The kid's been under a microscope for three years. The draft maybe didn't go the way he was expecting or the way other people are expecting. I um, and then he goes on to talk about his draft experience. Um, so then he goes on to say, you hope you land in a spot and it turns out hopefully better than uh, – better for you, excuse me, than where you thought you were going. I think that has potential to be the case with Shane Wright. Um, and so Ron Francis goes on to say, quote, I believe he's starting the season in Seattle. And when pressed for more information, he goes on to say, quote, I don't want to draw a line in the sand, but I would think he's with us for the year. It's just a matter of how things go and managing it. But I think he'll be fine. He's fit right in. He does a lot of good things. So that there you go, folks. Will Shane Wright be with us for the season? Ronnie Francis is saying, so I've been talking about this, that whole, you know, he'll have every opportunity to make the team. It sounded like the Seattle Kraken are planning to have Shane Wright. Of course, if he didn't make the squad or for whatever reason, isn't on the roster, barring injury, of course, which we are not hoping for, he would have to go back to his OHL squad. So coming up next, we're going to talk about some more good reads. I also want to talk about postseason Seattle sports. We're going to talk about the OL rain and of course the Mariners and how you can watch. And then 
get you ready for our defense talk with an article, another good read from our friend, the one and only Ryan Soto Clark, not covering exclusively the Seattle Kraken anymore, but doing an amazing job for ESPN.com. But right now, let's talk about Bet Online. Bet Online is your number one source for all your football betting this season. Latest player developments, team matchups, news podcasts, and in depth articles and analysis for every game, but not just for football for hockey as well. In the next segment, I'll tell you a little bit about um, how we're incorporating some of the bet online uh, future bets and over-unders right here on Locked on NHL and Locked on Kraken. So head to betonline.net, use your mobile device, your tablet, your desktop, whatever you got, uh, because bet online is where the game starts. Thank you, as always, Seattle hockey fans, for making Locked on Crack in your first listen of the day. The day, excuse me. We are your only daily podcast covering the Seattle Kraken. But that being said, there's amazing creators covering the Seattle Kraken. I know there was a little trivia showdown. I believe Emerald City Hockey has bragging rights for that one. Uh, 32 crew, um, you know, Davy Jones Locker just read a really interesting article there about who should be the next captain. That's another good read. But I want to talk about that a little bit later when we talk about leadership, maybe next week. So we're going to go back to Goodreads when I can. I want to get these journalists on the show, but I will be, whenever I find an article I find particularly intriguing, I want to share it right here on Locked on Kraken, as is the case with Ryan Soto Clark. I'm a big fan of Ryan. We um, have talked about his work before and this is going to be an interesting primer uh, as we get ready to talk about who is the Seattle Kraken's best defenseman, and is that defenseman is that defenseman a Norris Trophy candidate? Um, yeah, we'll talk about it anyway. Um, this article is from Ryan S. Clark, again, now with ESPN. How Kale McCarr, Adam Fox, and other fast young defensemen are changing the NFL. And this is all about thinking about the NFL, or excuse me, NHL. Whoop, that was a Freudian slip. The NHL, excuse me. This is all about thinking about the future. So it really fits in well. If you haven't listened to my conversation with Allison Lucan about positionless hockey, check that out in the show notes because a lot of what Allison is talking about and a lot of what was is in that book where she was learning about positionless hockey when it comes to, uh, to the, the book tape uh, to space, it's alluded to in this article by Ryan S. Clark. I love when things come full circle. I love when we just get a nice little wraparound. This was an awesome article, again, over on ESPN.com. And um, Roman, it starts off, Roman Josie was kind of joking, but he also kind of wasn't upon assessing what the Norris Trophy landscape could look like over the next decade. Josie, who won the Norris at as the NHL's top defenseman after the 2019-2020 season would know, the 31-year-old Nashville Predators captain appeared to be in position to capture a second Norris last season when he scored 23 goals, amassed 96 points, and averaged more than 25 minutes per game. Then came Kale McCarr, the 23-year-old Colorado Avalanche star dazzled throughout the season in scoring 28 goals, accruing 86 points, and also averaging more than 25 minutes per game. So interesting, interesting. Uh, uh, 96 points compared to 86 points, 23 goals compared to 28 goals. So those uh, five goals really make up for 10 assists. Mm, that's interesting. But Again, read this article. There's a lot in that article, including uh, th through the eyes of Kale McCarr, how he developed his game at a young age and who were some of the defensemen that he was watching that showed that, yeah, I can play defense and I can be a little bit more of an offensive uh, threat and 
have the puck, be in possession of the puck. He jokes around about watching some of his youth hockey tape and looking like a little bit of a, of a puck hog um, just because he always had the puck and was traveling from the defensive zone into the offensive zone. And so that's a little bit of an interesting conversation. I've had this debate before. The amazing Mike Murphy does great work in hockey analytics on the women's hockey side. The one time he and I got into a really heated conversation it was about defense because I disagreed that the best defender in at the time, the national women's hockey league, the NWHL is the defender with the most goals. The person who won the year in question, actually, if you watched the games had a really good D partner who oftentimes had to clean up because this particular shooter was was cheating and wasn't able to quickly get back on defense and that's what makes Kale McCarr different and I love in this article again a good read and hopefully we can have Ryan one day break this down but Ryan talks about that dichotomy between how we rank defense and even what defenders say good defense is and also kind of having to play that game of knowing that they want to be a part of winning teams knowing that they want to be up for individual awards knowing that they want to have lucrative contracts or bridge contracts as ryan mentions and what does that mean does that change how they have to play or at least how they have to talk about their game so again this is chock full of great nuggets it alludes to um or it reminds me i should say of the conversation that we had about allison about also thinking about defensemen or skilled players or the five players five skaters that you want on the ice in a different way ryan breaks that down as well and says that the the change that's happening the focus on puck moving defensemen as he says multiple times in the article has potential. And again, I talked about this with Allison. It has potential to change how hockey is played overall. If you remember though, my conversation with Allison, and it's, it's not alluded to in Ryan's piece, but in my conversation with Allison, my concern about this idea of positionless hockey or where we move toward positionless hockey to cultivate a puck moving defenseman is that we've seen professional leagues change the dynamics, change the physics of the game to suit what they think is most entertaining to their audience. MLB was the example that I used, changing the, the ball, changing the seams, changing the rules about the shift. I would hate to see that happen in hockey. So as much as I am all in on what is happening and this evolution of the defensemen in hockey, I have a lot of questions because I know from the entertainment side of sports, oftentimes the evolution is stymied, it's stunted, or it's misinterpreted to make a sport that's like, oh, watch my sport, which let's be honest, generally speaking, stereotypically hockey is one of those sports. So what does that mean for hockey? That is my analysis of Ryan Soto Clark's good read again, how Kale McCarr, Adam Fox, and other fast young defensemen are changing the NHL. Check the show notes. You can also check us on YouTube or, um, well, yes, check us on YouTube, but I meant to say, check us on social media because I have been sharing this article. I really enjoyed it. And I'm pretty sure we'll come back to it coming up on locked on Kraken. How can you watch the Mariners? How can you watch the OL rain and make sure you're supporting women believing women, and definitely not standing for abuse in sports. Thank you, as always, Kraken fans, for joining us here on Locked on Kraken. I hope you enjoyed my deep-ish dive, really more of a summary into some of my good reads, Pierre Lebrun, Kate Shefty, and Ryan Soto-Clark. This is a good reads turning up on a Thursday, but now I want you to get ready to celebrate other Seattle sports, and of course, that starts with the watch parties happening for the Mariners. Uh, tomorrow, wildcard game number one, watch party seven 
or excuse me, 1.07 p.m. Pacific time, afternoon delight for those of you on the West Coast. Same time on Saturday and then 11.07 a.m. bright and early on Sunday. This is how you can get tickets to watch at T-Mobile Park. We talked about this yesterday. This is a series against the Toronto Maple Leafs. Shane Wright, baby. Are you going to make the Kraken team and roster? Does it depend on who you are rooting for in the American League wild card? No, absolutely not. It definitely shouldn't. That's only for jokes, people. Only for jokes on the social media. Okay? That's... That's what we have going there. Another team later this month. First of all, your Shield winners, the Shields in the National Women's Soccer League, goes to the team with the best record, the OL Reign in the preseason, or what they call the um, the uh, Challenge Cup. It's kind of like a preseason tournament. They were having struggling coming out of the Challenge Cup, but then go on to go 11-4-7, and 7, 40 points overall, take the league, and that's amazing. You can see them in the postseason, in the semifinals, at Lumen Field. That's going to happen later in the month. But I want to point out this woman right here, fiance to one Sue Bird, making her half of essentially Seattle sports royalty. Megan Rapino has been so vocal about the Yates report. For those who don't know the Yates report, this is, uh, and I'll link it for those. Again, this is um, a report about the National Women's Soccer League. I do want to give a trigger, trigger warning. This does talk about sexual abuse and abusive behavior. The report, again, Trigger warning, this will talk about sex, sex, the sexual abuse, excuse me, and abusive behavior. The report is called the Report of Independent Investigation to the to US Soccer, to the US Soccer Federation concerning allegations of abusive behavior and sexual misconduct in women's professional soccer. Sally Q. Yates dropped that report. It came out earlier this week. Myself and a lot of other people have been working through it. It's several hundred hundred pages. And it reports a lot of really uh, foul, uh, unprofessional, absolutely disgusting things happening. But I mentioned that Pino, for uh, one of the leaders for the U.S. national team and right in Seattle for the OL Reign, ha has spoken to media earlier today. The U.S soccer team is uh, in the UK. They're getting ready to play some friendly matches. And she's been one of several voices really standing up for the players and making sure that a la what we're seeing happen with Hockey Canada, that no one is taken off the hook, that no one will be gaslighting or manipulating us to believe that it is uh, wrong that it is inappropriate to talk about the dismay and the disgust about what is in that Yates report. Unfortunately, we see Hockey Canada doing some of that, um, saying that the, the reports and the responses to the reports are over-exaggerated. How can you, how can you even, or saying things like in the case of Hockey Canada, that this isn't just a Hockey Canada problem, this is a problem throughout society? Yeah, no crap. No freaking crap. But for you to say that, that's the first thing after an investigation, after your own um, confessions, now you want to say in hearings, oh, it's not just us. Like, go point the finger somewhere else. What about responsibility? Isn't that one of the things that we try to teach at the youth level in hockey? You're taking no responsibility. And Hockey Canada is now losing sponsors left and right. Canadian Tire out. Uh, tell us and other places saying they will only fund youth and women's hockey. They have lost all confidence in hockey Canada. It's one thing to tolerate the abuse. It's one thing to ignore reports of abuse. It's one thing a la the NHL to say, oh, well, you know, we don't know. No one's responsible really for this. Like it was just bad communication, but it's not the fault of anyone. Then you know whose fault it is? It's the fault of the leadership. It's the fault of the league. It's the fault of the Players Association and the federations that can't come up with comprehensive 
policies. That's your fault. Hockey Canada, NHL, that's your fault. You have a responsibility as the governing body. And if there's no fault, then it's your fault. Why do coaches get fired? Heavy is the head. If things aren't going right, it starts at the top. And too many times at the top, we see people with power who all they want to do is keep that power. They don't care if they're burning money. They don't care if people are getting abused. All they care about is protecting their power. And so people like Megan Rapino, who represents Seattle via the OL Reign, those are the people that can speak truth to power. It's uncomfortable, it's awkward, but it's what's happening. And we cannot shirk and hide from the truth, especially the ugly truth. So that's me getting on my soapbox. I didn't necessarily want to end on that, but I didn't know how to go throughout the week without mentioning that. There's a lot happening in sport, in our sport of hockey, and impacting those people who we root for or should be representing Seattle. That's not even getting into what's happening in the NFL with concussion protocol. We've seen that happen in the, in the, in the NHL as well. It only stops if those of us who are witnessing this, those of us who read these reports like the Yates reports at minimum start asking questions. I'm not asking you to believe everything you read or hear. Please, goodness, don't. But use that gift of a brain that you have. Do some digging. Squeaky wheel gets the grease. That's what they say. But also, you start seeing patterns. Maybe it's not a squeaky wheel. Maybe it's patterns. And people's tired of being abused and neglected and ignored. Women tired of not being believed, of being blamed for the violence perpetuated on them. Maybe it's not a squeaky wheel. Maybe it's the cries of people over time saying that enough is enough. And we all have a responsibility. We all can take ownership of how we take information, how we analyze it further and what we choose publicly or, or otherwise to discern and share from that information. And the amount of people who just by reading a headline are okay with not believing people who've been victimized is disturbing. We've seen this in the NHL, Kyle Beach, teenager and his mom speaking up. These things are too often a part of the system. They are not the exception, but they are the norm. Just think about that. The exception is the report's being shared publicly. The rule, more often than not, is even when there are systems of reporting that they're not taken seriously. And we have to stop. This is not a hockey problem. Abuse is not a hockey problem. Covering up abuse seems to be a hockey problem, seems to be a sports problem. Unfortunately, you're right. Abuse isn't a hockey problem. Sexual assault, misconduct isn't a hockey problem. The problem with hockey and other sports is the cover-up, is protecting mostly men, mostly white men in power. That's a problem. We got a little heavy towards the end and I say this with all sincerity, especially given the topic, and why I say this every show is because of topics like this. Be kind to yourself. 
Be kind to each other. Be kind to yourself. This is not an easy topic for those who are a little closer to the topic than they'd care to be. Be kind to yourself and your process as you are absorbing this information. Please be kind to other people as they are working through things that you might have no access or no way of knowing about. Give them that time and that grace. And from a sporting perspective, let's hold fast and stay true. We've got one more preseason game. We'll talk about that tomorrow. But please, truly, be kind to yourself and to each other. I'll catch you on the next episode of Locked on Kraken.